Hello, my name is Lisa Dellinger and it is my privilege today to introduce to you Dr. George E. Tink Tinker. He is the Professor Emeritus at the Iliff School of Theology and has been a member of the faculty there since 1985. Dr. T Tinker teaches courses in American Indian cultures, history and religious traditions, cross-cultural and third world theologies, and justice and peace studies, and is a frequent speaker on these topics, both in the US and internationally. His publications include American Indian Liberation, A Theology of Sovereignty, Spirit and Resistance, Political Theology and American Indian Liberation, and Missionary Conquest, The Gospel and Native American Genocide. He co-authored a Native American theology and his co-editor of Native Voices, American Indian Identity and Resistance, and also the, Pre the Fortress Press's People's Bible. Dr. Tinker has volunteered in the Indian community as director of the Four Winds American Indian Survival Project in Denver for two decades. In that capacity, he functions in the urban Indian community as a traditional American Indian spiritual leader. He is past president of the Native American Theological Association and a member of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. Firmly committed to the ecumenical movement, he has been active in volunteer capacities with several denominations at the national level. Also the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches. He also served as an honorary advisor to the international movement against all forms of discrimination and racism and serves on the leadership council of the American Indian Movement of Colorado. On a more personal note, I know Dr. Tinker from our 2010 independent study where I studied the Christian milieu's impact upon Native American culture. He was also a, a member of my comprehensive exam committee and dissertation committee. He is a scholar who is generous with his time, his wisdom, and his support. He is a po prophetic political voice, and he has an incredible sense of humor. Dr. Tinker is an honorable man a man that I am proud to introduce to you. Thank you. A propitious day and greetings to all of you who are part of the Phillips Seminary community and are tuned in for this Remind and Renew program as we focus on uh, the trauma of historical trauma caused by incidents like the Tulsa Greenwood Massacre a hundred years ago. I'm Tink Tinker, a citizen of the Osage Nation, and our headquarters is just an hour north and a little west of Phillips Seminary. In fact, our traditional reservation lands extend all the way down uh, into the city limits of Tulsa. It's good to be with you all in this uh, video format, although I'd rather we didn't have the pandemic and I could have come uh, in to be with you in person and visit with my family while I was doing that. My topic for this first lecture is Euro-Christian white supremacy massacres, race, and indigenous trauma. As we commemorate the centenary of the Greenwood massacres in Tulsa, it's important for us to expand our vision and look at uh, trauma and violence across the continent and the historical trauma, especially that American Indians continue to live with to this day. At the time of the Tulsa massacre, Osages were going through their own new bit of trauma, something called the Osage Reign of Terror, whereby white folk on the Osage 
were busy trying to corner Osage wealth, and some 200 Osages or more were actually murdered uh, during that reign of terror uh, in order to transfer Osage oil head, head rights from Osages to white folk. I should add at this point that I'm not a great fan of David Grand's book, um, Killers of the Flower Moon. First of all, uh, the book is not about the Osage. It's actually an FBI thriller. Uh, and, and, it, and it says what its real agenda is in the subtitle, The Birth of the FBI. Uh, secondly, Grant only pays attention to the two dozen or so murders that were perpetrated by one uh, particular, uh, uh, you know, white man and, and his close family against Osages <coughs> when the actual number of murders uh, was in the hundreds. So the reign of terror was more than just 24 murders, uh, but it was something that went on in unexplained deaths of countless Osages in, in Greyhorse, uh, Pahuska, and Hominy. Uh, Greyhorse, although, seems to have been a main target because it was so remote from uh, the rest of the reservation. In any case, Osage wealth was world known at that point. Uh, not that it did Osages very much good at all, because Osage wealth mostly ended up in the pockets of white folk, either white business people uh, or uh, uh, white lawyers called euphemistically in federal Indian law guardians, because they would make up to, uh, you know, two to five thousand dollars a year for each Osage Indian for whom they served as a guardian. And each lawyer could serve as a guardian for up to at least five Osages. Strange stuff in retrospect. But there is one story that I want to tell about uh, that May and June, May and June 1 of 1921, as blacks fled the terror and the Holocaust in Greenwood. They fled mostly to the north and west up Clear Creek. And at that time, I had a grandpa, uh, you're a Christian by your Christian reckoning. I suppose he was a great, great uncle of some kind, uh, but he was a grandpa in Indian way, um, who had his allotment and a ranch on Clear Creek right outside of Skytook. Hundreds of blacks made their way to uh, uh, Franklin Tinker's ranch and overnighted there or spent a couple of days there for about 48 hours, making their way further north to the safety of Pahuska. And I'm happy to say that uh, once they were in on the Osage Reservation, they, many of them stayed for uh, a lifetime and found work there, given jobs uh, by Osage people helped Osage people with their ranching and farming. That's a memory that not very many people, even in, Osa even in the Osage nation, maintain yet today, I think. I live in Denver, Colorado, where the most egregious memory of American Indian genocide is the 1864 Sand Creek Massacre which is now a national historical site. It was a massacre of an explicitly peaceful uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho village. The murders were so egregious that they occasioned three separate U.S. Army and congressional hearings. Uh, the perpetrators uh, were removed in one case from office and ushered out of the U.S. Army in the other in considerable disgrace. The main perpetrator was a Methodist minister who gave up his orders in order to uh, assume uh, an officer's rank in the U.S. military. The territorial governor was John Evans, a prime Methodist layperson 
who started three different educational institutions, uh, uh, two Methodist universities and one seminary, Northwestern uh, University of Denver and uh, Garrett Evangelical, uh, what is now Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Uh, both gentlemen, uh, Colonel John Shivington, the Methodist uh, minister, had actually been district superintendent of Colorado uh, before he resigned his, uh, his orders. Uh, <clears throat> Both gentlemen were on the uh, founding committee, the board of trustees for what is today still the most prominent Methodist church uh, in, in, in Denver, uh, Trinity Methodist Church. And both of them, it should be noted, were diehard abolitionists. That's, in fact, why Shivington gave up his Methodist orders to join the military. He wanted to fight to, uh, with the Union Army in order to end slavery. Okay, here's the question. How could men so dedicated to something right on the one hand be dedicated to something so wrong on the other hand, even extending to the murder of human beings. What was it about Indians that generated their wrath and anger when the chiefs from that Cheyenne Arapaho village at Sand Creek made a special trip under army escort, actually, two months before the massacres in order to pursue peace in Denver with the governor and uh, the military commander, Colonel uh, Shivington, uh, as they made that trip, they were told point blank by the territorial governor that they could, essentially, that they could expect a wintertime attack, that that was his plan. Uh, so they went home empty-handed, uh, hoping only for the best, flying a a U.S. flag and a white flag of truce in front of the main lodge, uh, Black Kettle's Lodge, uh, in, in the village. Pastor John Shivington, now Colonel Shivington, had hoped that his uh, murderous attack on, on a peaceful shine in Arapaho village would gain him promotion to Brigadier General. Instead, uh, he ended up resigning his commission in disgrace. Back around 2010-2011, the United Methodist Church enlisted me to help them sort out their uh, culpability with respect to th egregious moments like the Sand Creek Massacre uh, and the equally egregious and equally murderous uh, uh, Trail of Tears in which uh, uh, Methodists tend to side with Andrew Jackson politically across the South. They called the program an act of repentance. And I tried relatively unsuccessfully, I think, to encourage them to see repentance as a plural, as acts, as ongoing, uh, be, be, because the oops, I'm sorry, one time moment doesn't seem to capture what the Christian Bible means by the Greek word metanoia. Uh, but rather metanoia is, is something that is more ongoing, especially uh, in the Greek present tense of, of the imperative, say, in Mark 1. Acts of repentance. They were trying hard and have tried hard since. But you see, the people who were the victims at that point, are still suffering from the trauma generated by those murders. You know, stop and think for a minute. Imagine a child at Sand Creek, five years old, six years old, suddenly seeing his or her mother's Entered splattered all over the side of a teepee wall by cannon shot. 
Now that child is being taken off to a boarding school where they're supposed to learn to be Christian and, and supposed to learn to be civilized, yet that intense post-traumatic stress disorder won't go away for a lifetime. It's imprinted deep in the recesses of that person's consciousness uh, to, to come up in all kinds of harmful ways uh, as that person uh, grows into adulthood and even into uh, older life. That's the consequence of these actions. So the Methodist Church had to figure out how to hold themselves accountable at this late date. Eventually, you know, after serving for a couple of years as an advisor on their planning committee, uh, they invited me to be a speaker at the uh, general conference in 2012 held in Tampa, Florida. During those meetings, those advisory meetings with the National Planning Committee, one United Methodist professor from back east, the northeast, I should say, pulled me aside during a coffee break and asked a heartfelt question. Tink, this professor said, were there other instances like Sand Creek in American history? I nearly dropped my cup of coffee. I was so stunned. I looked at the person. I took a deep breath and I said, yes, all of them. Be because you see, if we go back to the first landings on the North American continent, we call Turtle Island, go back to the first Episcopal settlement at Jamestown. Go back to the first pilgrim landing at Plymouth or go back to the first not so pure Puritans who arrived in Boston in 1630. Violence and murder of Indians was part and parcel of the Christian invasion of this continent and it hasn't stopped as we have seen now in, in, in assaults like pipelines being driven across unceded treaty land in places like Standing Rock, South Dakota, going underwater, uh, you know, underneath the, the, the water supply of the Standing Rock, not just the Standing Rock Nation, but all the other Indian nations along the river uh, uh, in, in North and South Dakota. And of course, when the Indian people resist peacefully, unlike the rabble at the White House on January 6th of this year, the white supremacist rabble, Indians engaging in peaceful protests were met by a rural sheriff's department that were so loaded with heavy military weaponage uh, and tank-like vehicles, armored personnel carriers, and heavy weapons, <clears throat> all provided at that point by the Obama administration, uh, not a Republican administration, and, and, and had to face off with uh, uh, attack dogs, uh, all of which showed up then eventually on national media. We can't even voice our resistance yet today without being attacked in return. Before we leave Cheyenne Peace Chief Black Kettle and his people behind, we need to note that they suffered a second massacre, a second vicious attack by a U.S. Army unit nearly four years to the day after the attack at Sand Creek. Black Kettle and his wife had survived that uh, attack. They were not to survive this second massacre. The Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Kiowa had established four villages together 
for the winter time along the Washita River in western Oklahoma. Uh, today it's the state of Oklahoma, but western Indian territory. Black Kettle was the fourth of those villages, and he, uh, his people were camped some five miles upstream from the others. Custer chose to attack the already heavily traumatized Black Kettle village for two reasons. First of all, like Shivington before him, he knew it was defenseless and would be an easy military uh, victory. So he did attack, slaughtered near over a hundred women and children and old people. Uh, but then he had a second part of his plan. He took more than 80 women and children hostage to use as a human shield to defend his units against the legitimate military contingent of, uh, uh, of Indians from the other three villages who, uh, who, who came immediately upriver when they started to hear uh, cannon fire and, 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 and gunshots from Black Kettle's village. And the Indian military contingents did indeed withdraw when they saw that their women and children were being held hostage. Here you have a picture of that, uh, some of the captives who were taken to Fort Dodge in Kansas. For the children in this photograph, it may have been the last time they saw their parents or loved ones until they turned 18 as trauma was piled on top of trauma and they were hauled away to be incarcerated in these new institutions that were popping up across Turtle Island and across Indian uh, territory, the modern state of Oklahoma. Institutions euphemistically called boarding schools but education wasn't the purview of these schools. Rather, what they were about is manual training. Manual training and one other important part of the colonization, Christianization, civilization process. They were trying to turn these children into mimics of of white Euro-Christian people, teaching them how to dress, how to behave like white people so that they might not only survive in white society uh, off of their land, but, but, but so that uh, uh, they might work usefully in the labor force as employees of white people uh, doing domestic houseware, uh, household chores for uh, white women and, and farm and ranch hand uh, chores for, uh, for, for, you know, on white ranches. That's uh, one of those institutions a couple hours north and west of uh, uh, Phillips Seminary. In fact, it's just across the Arkansas River from the Osage Reservation on the northwest corner uh, up near the Kansas state line was called Shiloko Indian Agricultural School, about 20 miles north of Ponca City. Not unlike most Indian boarding schools, of Shiloko's more than 18,000 Indian students, only about 5,000 of them actually got a piece of paper that said they were high school graduates. We don't know what happened to most of the others. In fact, we don't know uh, how many at Chiloco died while they were uh, uh, students there? What we know nationally is across the continent <coughs> is that sometimes as many as 25% of students in a boarding school would die in the course of a year. Uh, they're not very sanitary places. The, the diet was not good. They were given mostly scraps. The uh, uh, the, the best groceries were kept, of course, for the staff. They're the ones that got uh, p potatoes with butter, uh, while the kids sometimes only had scraps of bread. And we know that diseases ran rampant in these institutions, 
and that the cemeteries uh, have graves in numbers that far outnumber the high school graduates. These schools serve colonial conquest in another important way. Namely, they were part of the Christian and liberal political uh, policy agenda to erase Indian languages so that whether the school was a church school or federally run, children were punished for speaking their own native language. It's not so much that they lost their language during their boarding school time, but rather that they were so intimidated by the process that they thought it best that their own children did not learn the, the native tongue and learned only to speak the colonial language, the common colonial language on this part of Turtle Island being English, of course. The long-term trauma for Indian peoples is that uh, loss of language means also uh, a significant loss of culture and a shift in worldview. And so we have Indian nations across Turtle Island struggling today to uh, uh, engage in language retention programs, trying to teach the younger generation language that they've never really spoken at all. And all too often as we relearn the language, we relearn it with an English substructure instead of the old uh, structure and, and, and meaning that was inherent in the old Indian language. And of course, at this moment, at the height of this COVID-19 pandemic, on reservation after reservation, we're losing far too many of the last native speakers of languages, which means the next generation is in for an even more difficult struggle to maintain language and culture. Language is critical, of course, but it's not the only issue we have to deal with, although we'll come back to it uh, again during my second lecture. The truth is that today, in this late stage of Euro-Christian colonialism, Indian people are far from healthy. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, a uh, former colleague of mine at the University of Denver, who now uh, teaches at the University of New Mexico, talks about historical trauma and intergenerational trauma. You know, it's, it's, it's all too well known that Indian people deal with a host of issues. Uh, perhaps one of the most public of those is, is the problem many Indian people have with addictive behaviors. Some 30 years ago, however, I began to talk about a community-wide PTSD as being common in Indian communities. That is, it's a post-traumatic stress disorder, a, a depression that permeates the whole of a, of a community. It's not an individual disorder or disease, but rather it is a social uh, condition. Here's a list of a few of the uh, most visible effects of, uh, of historical trauma and unresolved grief that, that we struggle with in the Indian world. I, I, I say they're the most visible. There are deeper, more significant causes that we'll get to uh, in my second lecture. But, but it needs to be known that American Indians to this day are the poorest ethnic community in North America. So the poverty is widespread, as is unemployment, 
which contributes to the poverty. Abject anti-Indian racism uh, results in what I mark on this list as abuse. Uh, the per capita uh, killings of Indian young people by police is actually higher than it is for African Americans. It just happens in more rural areas uh, all too often and hence doesn't uh, come up in the public eye as much. And of course, we now have white supremacists driving around Washington, D.C. or Sturgis, South Dakota, uh, hanging their heads out the windows, yelling in D.C., we're coming after blacks and Indians or uh, up in Sturgis, South Dakota, identifying Indians because that's a heavily American Indian state. But perhaps the biggest example of abuse is the abuse of American Indian women by off-reservation non-Native men who know that uh, because of the way the law is structured, they are undoubtedly not going to be uh, investigated, let alone prosecuted for any crimes they might commit uh, against an Indian woman on reservation land. Uh, and if the, 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 the big movement across the U.S. and particularly across Canada today is this movement called the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Movement. American Indian health concerns have only been exacerbated by this pandemic repeatedly through the months. The highest hospitalization rate across Turtle Island has been on one reservation or another from Alabama to Arizona, from South Dakota to North Dakota. As we try to express our discontent, we're told just get over it. Let the past be the past. But PTSD, intergenerational trauma, is a deeply rooted organic mental health disorder. We now know that PTSD has a complex intergenerational genetic linkage, that is, historical trauma is rooted in the biology of the human brain. Uh, depression, bipolar anxiety, a bipolar disorder or anxiety, we don't tell those people just get over it. We can't tell somebody with anxiety disorder to just stop. That doesn't quite work. Evidently, by the way, the same is true of uh, the uh, white supremacy disorder, uh, the dominant disorder that affects uh, every Euro Christian on Turtle, Turtle Island today, the American Indian mind has been, the communal American Indian mind has been affected by 528 years of Euro Christian colonial violence, but so has the Euro Christian colonizers' mind been affected. And it simply won't go away, it seems, uh, either from American Indians or, or our, our colonizer. It needs to be said, of course, that Indian people are not sitting around waiting for the U.S. government or, for that matter, the Christian churches to come to our rescue to uh, uh, help in our healing process. We understand that we have to do that ourselves. But you need to understand how difficult that is at this late date uh, in the history of colonial conquest. Unlike the white supremacist rabble of armed violent insurrectionists in Washington, D.C. Uh, on January 6th of this year, Explicitly peaceful Indian protest always seems to get met with the unmitigated force with violent state policing. I mean, the most uh, egregious example in the last couple of years was the protest at Standing Rock over against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Now, 
North Dakota in 2016 was a state with under a total population of 800,000 people. Morton County, and we're looking in that in these pictures at Morton County Sheriff's Department is a county of 31,000 people total, a large, largely rural county, and yet they had the financial resources to field a virtual army. You can see the heavily militarized uh, personnel carriers, uh, a whole line of them coming up uh, against a, a lone Indian man on horseback or an Indian in another picture defending uh, uh, the self with merely an eagle tail fan. An eagle, I'm sorry, a wing. For Indian people, water is sacred, if I can use that word. The saying at Standing Rock, uh, still to this day, is Mni Wichoni, water is life. And for all of us, every day begins with a ceremonial greeting of water, our relative, our close and old relative, even if that water comes out of a bathroom tap anymore. In the old Osage towns, people would get up in the morning, leave their lodges, and they would sing a morning song. Every person had their own individual personal morning song. Then next, they would go down to the creek and wash themselves, and not until they had greeted the water and used the water to bathe their bodies did they, were they ready to come up and engage in social life of the village. So when this huge oil conglomerate energy transfer uh, got federal permission to tunnel under Lake Oahe, uh, just on the north border of Standing Rock Reservation, the people went into action to resist it. And eventually, there were hundreds of people from Standing Rock, hundreds of Indians from all over Turtle Mountain, and hundreds of non-Indian allies who showed up to join in that resistance. The resistance movement set up three huge camps. Here you can see one of those camps from the air. Uh, the other two are no smaller. A more ground level view into Ocheti Shakawin uh, shows the density of the camp. This is late November. Uh, the camp is already becoming firmly established. Their commitment to the sacredness of their water supply was such that the uh, camps endured undiminished through the cold, harsh North Dakota winter, through more than one blizzard, and in the face of uh, a militarized. There were a number of cultural fundamentals that powered the Indian resistance at Standing Rock. First of all is the underlying sense of what I call communityism. And communityism stands over against the radical individualism of the Euro Christian West, the, the notion that is so deeply rooted in, in, in all Euro Western thinking, uh, including the Reformation notion of the justification of the individual by that person's faith. For Indian people, it's always about the good of the whole, about all of us. Indian people also resist buying into Euro-Christian temporality. Uh, te temporality is that notion of, of salvation or and eschatology, the end of time, uh, progress and development, which make, makes its way uh, uh, in, in, into the, the world of politics and, and corporate big business. That's what drives the military-industrial complex, if you will. <coughs> <clears throat> 
and it even makes its way into the education system. I have a 12-year-old daughter, and from uh, kindergarten on, her schools were pressing notions of being college ready at five and six years old. But going to college is precisely about keeping the economic and political system afloat. For Indian people, instead of temporality and time, the foundation is spatiality, place, the land. So Indian resistance is about the land, first of all, about the water, about the community's well-being. It's about our culture and our language. <clears throat> but don't make the mistake of thinking it's about cultural difference only. Some sort of tragic clash of cultures. You saw a lot of your Christian pundits frame uh, what happened to Indian people. Our trauma becomes for them an oops, I'm sorry moment. And, and that won't quite work because it's not about clash of cultures. From our perspective, it's much more about conquest and domination. It's about conquest and domination in the Euro-Christian mold versus the Euro, the, 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 the Indian notions, the indigenous notions of harmony and balance, of living in close relationship with all our non-human relatives, particularly with the land. It's about white Euro-Christian superiority's insistence that their models are the best. Their norms are universal norms. Their ways are right and should be imposed willy-nilly on everyone else in the world they meet. Theirs is civilization as opposed to savagery and uncivilized behavior on the part of others. White superiority your Christian supremacy, its colonial system, worked that way from its religious values, missionary conquest, all the way through U.S. foreign policy. And it still works that way. And if you haven't paid attention to U.S. foreign policy from that perspective, it might be good to... Uh, to pay attention. Try, for instance, convincing the military uh, industrial complex otherwise. So here we're not just talking about my early book, Missionary Conquest, but we're talking about the holy gospel of the economic system that the Euro Christians brought with them. The political system of procedural democracy that swept aside the consensual Indian democracies as savage and inadequate. And we have to be talking about the legal system that the Euro Christian supremacists invented in order to legally justify their domination legal codes and discourses that are still functional to this day. That's the ongoing source of American Indian pain, of American Indian trauma, of that which has left Indian communities as less than completely whole.